Great, so welcome. Uh, fantastic to have you here in the classroom. Uh, Peter Pryor, my mentor, and Peter Lamont, my father. Great to have you uh, both here in the virtual classroom. A uh, pair, pair of Peters. Peter. <laughs> uh, for our presentation tonight on how to mature your wine. So uh, we'll take a look at, um, well, first of all, my name is Malcolm Lamont. I'm a holder of the diploma with the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, as well as a Bachelor of Education and a certified wine educator. And for tonight, we'll take a look at uh, how, to, how to time to mature your wine, how to mature your wine, but also why, what, how, and when to mature your wines. So we're gonna go through each of those uh, in, in process. There we go. So, but first a question for those here in the classroom and um, feel free to uh, shout out your answer if you have if you have an answer to this question. So what do these have in common? Chocolate, leather, coffee, honey, nuts, and tobacco. Bitters? That's a good, good, very good answer, yeah. Uh, most of them are bitter, yeah, for sure. The exception of uh, honey. But... Yeah, maybe not honey, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, honey. definitely, definitely bitter. I hadn't thought of that one. Good you could age them if you want to. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> leather, leather and uh, leather. Know, yeah. Honey, honey wouldn't wouldn't expire. But what I was going for is these are all the aromas you can get from an aged wine. So as wines age, uh, for red wines they can turn into chocolate or leather, tobacco, forced floor, coffee, mocha. White wines can uh, mature into uh, aromas of honey, nuts, ginger, other exotic spices. Um, really lovely complex flavors that you can get from uh, such as these from from age one. Good point. Thank you. So why would you age uh, a wine? Why would you bother going through all that process of aging a wine, which we're going to talk about? Uh, well, there's the aforementioned aromas, the flavors and aromas you can get from aging and maturing your wine, uh, such as honey or nuts for white wines, tobacco, forced floor, game, bacon, these really savory, lovely flavors. Uh, but also the texture of wine evolves as it matures in a, in a proper cellar. So wine's texture uh, might soften out, might become more harmonious and, and smoother as the wine ages. When a wine's young, especially if it's designed to age and be, it might be a full rich style red wine and uh, might be a little bit too brash in its youth, but as it matures, uh, over time in a proper cellar, the texture uh, really smooths out and harmonizes uh, in an aging wine. And so in addition to the aromas and flavors and texture of the wine that you get with a matured wine, also the experience of tasting uh, a wine that's uh, completely harmonious and matured uh, is just one of a kind. Uh, so what kind of wines would you mature? Well, might be easier to talk about what kind of wines not to age. So uh, first of all, inexpensive wines generally don't age. And the reason for that is that inexpensive wines tend to be made with uh, grapes that are inexpensive to produce. And so they lack, they lack the proper flavor. There's nothing there that will mature into something like coffee or tobacco or mocha um, as it ages. So there's, there's a lack of flavor uh, that you won't get any return from aging an inexpensive wine. So in our market in Ontario and Canada, about $20, maybe $25 is kind of a, almost a tipping point where less than $20, certainly less than 18, they, not really any of those wines will mature, uh, develop into something that will be more complex and reward uh, selling. But around $20, $25, you might start to see a wine that's designed to mature in a proper cellar will reward um, mat maturation and aging. Most white wines, I would say a little bit more than half of the white grape varieties aren't designed to mature. Moscato or Muscat grape variety, Pinot Gris, although there are some exceptions, Pinot Grigio, um, Pinot Blanc, uh, Chasselas, these are not uh, grape varieties that are designed to mature. Uh, there are some notable white wines that do mature, Riesling, a good quality Riesling, uh, certainly will, as well as high quality Chardonnay from Chablis, for example, or Bourgogne. Um, might age really nicely for two to five years, depending on the quality. Um, Chenin Blanc, as well as Semillon, uh, especially from Australia, can uh, be notable white grape varieties that mature well and develop those really complex uh, savory aromas. 
Uh, most rosé wines, rosé is not uh, just like the white wines that are designed to be drunk current vintage. So we're talking 2019 currently for most white wines uh, being December 2020 uh, or 2019 or maybe a Southern Hemisphere 2020 uh, white wine or rosé wine. That, those would be the vintages you'd be looking for to consume them in their youth. Um, most rosé, there are some rosés that will mature, but uh, very few um, except, exceptions such as perhaps Tavelle or um, Bandol might be another uh, rosé that would be worth maturing. Uh, for the same reason as the uh, inexpensive white wines, uh, many red wines uh, will not mature as well. Can we ask you questions or should we wait? Yeah, let's, let's go for it. Okay, I was going to say, um, how do you know when to, 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 that you should be cellaring your, your wine? What is, is there, is it one key ingredient that sort of for the one? Well, so that, that, that's actually a beautiful uh, segue into this slide. So let's talk okay. about what's, what's on this slide because that's exactly where we are. Uh, so what, what should you look for? What allows a, white, a wine to age? So I say, go for it. I would say um, an age-worthy wine has that interesting flavor. So um, there would be a concentration of flavor. So if you bought, for example, uh, Jancis Robinson describes um, the uh, act activity of monitoring a case, which is, she describes it as a rich person sport. So monitoring a case involves purchasing a case of 12 bottles of wine and having one every you know, six months or a year or two years and monitoring, seeing how that age-worthy wine evolves after 12 bottles and how it was in its youth and how it is towards the end. So you can do similar versions. You can buy two bottles of wine and monitor it. So you'd open the first wine when you buy it, current vintage. And then if it's got flavor concentration, as well as structure. So those are the two main ingredients for maturing a wine. So you want a lot of flavor, a lot of fruit flavor in its youth, maybe some nice spice or some earthy characteristics, minerality, for example. Um, uh, but if there's a lot of flavor and a lot of structure, structure is a wine term for basically what you can detect on the palate. So in a red wine, it's tannins, a okay. kind of drying puckering sensation. If a, a red wine is tannins and acidity is the other type of structure that will allow wine to age. So if there's good tannins, good acidity and good flavor, this is the type of wine that will age those flavors through the, the evolution of, this, of the tannins and the structure will evolve into complex flavors and give you an age age worthy wine in a good cellar. So this is really what, what we're looking for here. So that flavor concentration, yeah. uh, that can also be detected on the finish. So wine that has a long, savory, pleasant finish in its youth, that, that probably also has a lot of flavor and those, those flavors and finish will evolve over time into, into an age worthy complex uh, bouquet wine. Okay. Now you say a, a good cellaring. So what what do you need for a cellar? Okay, very good. So let's go on to the how. So what do you need for a good cellar? <laughs> so to properly <laughs> age wine, you're, you're bang on tonight, Peter. I appreciate it. <laughs> there's to properly a good age, sorry? There's a good cellar. <laughs> so this, yeah, this is a picture I pulled off of, uh, off of Google. But essentially to age a wine, uh, an underground cellar is ideal. And the reason it's ideal is it's got uh, the top three criteria of temperature, light, and humidity. So of these, the most important is temperature. And that's why basements, uh, underground cellars are, are ideal because they mitigate this, the seasonal fluctuations and the daily fluctuations of temperature. So um, the range you want is about 10 to 15 Celsius year round, which is 50 to 60 Fahrenheit. And it can go a little bit higher in the summer and a little bit lower in the winter, but slow, gradual changes throughout the year. So, a, you know, an underground ba cellar or basement is going to mitigate those uh, swings of, of the external environment. Uh, so, ideally, temperature is moderate, around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, and gradual, gradual fluctuations or limited fluctuations throughout the year. Uh, limited exposure to light, especially uh, sunlight. Ideally, you'd have uh, a dark you know, uh, incandescent illuminated uh, cellar. Uh, and humidity, it's important that it not be too dry um, uh, for the simple reason that the corks can dry out in a dry cellar and then oxygen seeps through uh, the, the shrunk dried cork and oxidizes the wine and then it, it'll age too quickly and you'll actually lose, you'll lose it by the time you open it. Uh, so in, in a good cellar, uh, that's another reason you want to have the cork on its side. So if it's a 
a bottle of wine with a screw cap. That's fine. You can leave it standing. Also, champagne cork. Champagne is fine standing up on its on its end uh, in a cellar. Uh, but if it's a typical bottle of red wine or even white wine with a cork, you want that on its side to keep the wine in contact with the cork, and that keeps the cork moist and and doing its job in the sealing the sealing the bottle of wine. If you have the cork standing up, a bottle of wine with a cork in it and standing up, then that will dry out as well, and you'll lose uh, some oxygen. Yeah, this, this particular cellar seems seems to be ignoring your advice. At least they all look. <laughs> yes, good eye, problem. good eye. That, <laughs> I thought about yeah. that when I added the picture, but uh, I'm not sure why. Why are they going with that? Maybe they're That's all right. things. <laughs> it was the best best picture I could find for uh, temperature temperature and kind of underground uh, cellar. Uh, so what, what, uh, yes, what's your what's your view on a, a wine cell like a wine fridge? I've got a, I have ha, I got a pretty decent wine fridge. It's been working well for the last 10, 15 years actually. Yeah. Uh, what do you think though? Is it like as I was thinking, it's got temperatures that we we don't keep it in, we keep it underneath the stairs. Yeah. With dark humidity, I don't know. Yeah. The, so wine, the wine fridges wine fridges work work great because I keep the even temperature. It's even more even than uh, than a cellar yeah. where there are small right. fluctuations um so so they work great they'll they'll mature wine if you have it in there for two years five years ten years if the wine's age worthy um uh, you know especially if you're living in a down you know burlington or downtown toronto downtown manhattan you know these major metropolis cities then then it's basically you don't have room for a cellar and to mm -hmm. store wine and temperature control and humidity and all that uh, so wine fridges can be great. Where the downside is that uh, Jancis Robinson um, describes them as inefficient. So I, I think she's referring to the energy that they use, um, maybe because yeah. they're not insulated like a like a, a kitchen yeah. fridge. Um, right. So I'd say that's probably the only downside. So as long as the, the electricity bill uh, is working out well, then uh, then there's no problems. Uh, so the third point here is to keep inventory. So a uh, good um, uh, inventory tracker, cellar tracker, a good app for that, that keeps track of what's going in and out of your cellar um, so that you know what's there. As the cellar, as the collection gets larger, you need to keep track of what's down there. Yeah, you can also use tags and um, pen and paper, the old, the old fashioned way. Uh, but just since we're talking about apps, there's also Vivino. Are either of you familiar with uh, Vivino? Yes. Yes? Let's describe. And no, no. So Vivino is an app as well. It's, it's widely used. It's um, I, re I recommend it for a lot of students who are getting into wine. Um, it's got a inventory tracker ability on the app, and it's also got uh, features. Um, it's got like a rating system that uh, peer reviews are posted up to the app, and you can scan a bottle. So it's a very popular app for people just getting into into wine. That um, I thought I could recommend here. Now my problem is I I don't keep track, and what I what I like about it is I forget about it, and then I go back and I have I, I check it out, and then oh I find a real nice surprise. You know, I got a 2001. I better yeah. drink that. Yeah, <laughs> and it's worked out well. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, surprise is a good way to go. Or you know if you keep track, then um, wine probably has a longer life than you know if it's a good quality wine. If it's meant to age, if it falls under the you know, uh, uh, what categories, uh, then, then it probably lasts longer than, than most people would think. It, it's probably more likely to last from 2001 or depending on the wine, um, maybe 2010 would be kind of a nice yeah. turning point. Um, right. You know, some wines, they will go too far and then it's just kind of smells like kind of an oxidative kind of a sherry or dried, dried, dried leaf, dried uh, floor. Uh, just it's, it loses all its vivacity and its life. So, um, but but I've got surprised. I've got some bottles of laughing stock. Yes, and it like it's turned out really well. Yeah, so <laughs> laughing stock is a great uh, Okanagan winery, especially the reds are full body. Yes, a high quality, age worthy wine. Okay. And uh, when I was in the Okanagan, I was lucky to taste a few um, aged Okanagan wines, especially their Chardonnays, uh, which oh. are aging beautifully. It's uh, such a perfect climate for a region. Uh, for aging wines, because the the this the the way the Okanagan is is yeah. uh, they can produce high quality wines with um, high acidity. So again, that structure, and but they get a lot of sunlight, so there's a lot of flavor. So it's you know the best quality wines from the Okanagan are some of the most age worthy I've ever 
uh, encountered. And I, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if laughing stock really matures into the, um, you know, Pretty really good. savory tobacco forest floor aromas. Hmm. Okay, so uh, let's review. So um, when would you age a wine? So let's say you uh, I think the best time to age a wine is uh, when you have a wine, say a Laughing Stock or an Okanagan or good quality Italian wines can age really well from Tuscany, French, of course. Um, if it's a type of wine that will age and you have it and you have the right cellaring conditions and you want to get those desirable flavors and that desirable texture and experience from your aged wine, uh, then that's uh, the time to go for it. And so my final question is who should mature their wines? Well, you uh, should mature your wines <laughs> and enjoy them at their best and enjoy the, get the most uh, from, from the wines you invest in, in, uh, in your cellar. Uh, that's good. That's so thank good you one. very much. Oh, Great. Likewise. I really enjoyed that. Uh, yeah, I, I just can't wait to get uh, my hands on a nice bottle of red. <laughs> but I'm going to have to wait. <laughs> I got a bottle of, I've got a bottle of duckhorn uh, yeah, I bought it maybe six years ago. It's uh, it was 135 bucks for so that.